Welcome to the Startup Grind. Sue is a passionate advocate for libraries and librarians. She's committed to the development of the next generation of librarian leaders and has created opportunities for those in the field to reshape learning for the 21st century patron. In 2013, Sue Considine was honored as a White House champion of change due to her leadership in integrating STEM learning as a core part of library services. The Fayetteville Free Library, or FFL, is broadening the focus of libraries all over the country to tackle new literacy, to tackle new uh, literacies crucial to 21st century life. So if you all could give a big round of applause for our guest today, Sue Considine. Hey, Tony. Hey, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Doing fantastic. Um, we, I just, again, want to thank you for being here today. I know that you have a crazy busy schedule. I hear that you're going to be on a flight tomorrow to go and be an ambassador for Central New York and all this other stuff. So if you could really just quickly give the audience a sense of who you are, what you do, and why you're here today. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm not one of those magical people who can remember everything I need to say without my notes, so I am going to refer to my notes, so forgive me in advance. Um, so I'm super excited and very proud to be here representing the FFL. We are who we are only because of my extraordinary talented team. So a big shout out and thank you to all of the creative doers on the professional team, and also a huge thank you to all of our student support staff members, SU students and beyond, who support and serve our community and contribute groundbreaking ideas that change our game and impact the life of our community every day. And finally, to our engaged, involved, amazing community, after all, we do what we do at their request and on their behalf. Only with their support can we be successful in our mission. So as Tony was mentioning, tomorrow I'm honored and excited to be heading down to DC to participate as a speaker at both the first ever Capitol Hill Maker Fair and then the two-day National Maker Fair. So proud to uh, represent the creativity and innovation that's happening at not only the FFL and in libraries, but also in Syracuse and Central New York. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's, <laughs> that's like worthy of an applause, folks. That's worthy of an applause. Um, so we're just going to dive right into questions. Again, this is a very casual conversation um, to really learn more about you as the individual, you as the professional, and then you as the passionate advocate. Okay. So some background stuff. Um, how does the library embrace technology and innovation? Mm -hmm. Well, our mission, very simply put, then and now, is to provide free and open access to ideas and information. What librarians need to do well is to understand what's important in their community today. Civic and social issues, technology trends, ever-changing formats for accessing content, all literacies, early, financial, digital, job and career resources and assistance, these are all dynamic priority areas that are constantly shifting. So as librarians, through both formal in, in, and informal methods, including conversations, assessment, and observation, we need to be flexible and be ready to pivot at any time to create access to the resources, learning opportunities, technologies, and experiences that are important to our community today. Not tomorrow, not next year, but today. We're constantly asking ourselves as individuals and as a team, what is a library? What do librarians do? Why do we do what we do? And with this worldview, we're in a constant state of change, ready to ask the hard questions and, and allowing us to stop doing what does not produce value and move on to what's next. We've always, per our mission, created access to information, software, technologies, content in multiple formats, spaces, and most importantly, to each other. It was a very natural process when we began to consider, assess, and ultimately integrate disruptive technologies like 3D printers, laser cutters, video editing, editing equipment, preloaded circulating devices, and more into our services and our offerings. That's awesome. That's awesome. So again, being that this is a casual conversation, I'm going to tell Sue not to read again. OK. This is, OK? Because um, we had a really great, we were here at 4 o'clock, OK? And I really tried my best to not talk too much because all the good stuff was, I didn't want to waste all the good stuff. Uh, but we had a really great conversation. I want to make sure that we keep that. So I apologize, Sue, but 
they'll read again. Okay, I'm going to point to you if I forget the important <laughs> things that it's I, okay <laughs> because I because I remember. Um, talk a little bit about the two things that um, Leah didn't want you to forget. So Leah, just so you know, is one of uh, Sue's amazing staff members at the library. Leah Krauss, key so, member yes. of, of, of implementation of our fabrication lab. We have three maker spaces: our fabrication lab, a digital content creation lab, and a little maker space. And Leah gave me a list of things with a big don't forget to mention at the top of it. So um, one of Tony's questions to me in advance was what does the library offer entrepreneurs and innovators? So if you visit our website at www.fflib.org backslash make, here you'll find resources, inventory lists, program ideas, links to all sorts of information that will be helpful to you. In a quick snapshot, in addition to sewing machines, hand tools, laser cutter, CNC router, STEM kits, Arduinos, vinyl cutter, craft supplies, and more, today you will find five MakerBot 3D printers and two new Mojo business class printers, especially intended for prototyping that the public can access. That's awesome. Members of the public can also access SolidWorks professional 3D modeling software on every computer in the Fab Lab and take one-on-one -on -one SOLIDWORKS lessons for free from engineers. And most recently, we've established a new CNY maker meet meetup group who meet once a month on Wednesdays. The first meeting will be on June 17th. Please come, if you're free, at 6.30. And you can also find out more about this at our website or at meetup.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. And we will have that information available for everyone at, during the networking event. Okay, or the networking portion after the event. Okay, so um, you touched on a lot of really good points there, and I want to give the audience for those who haven't been, who don't know much about makers, or um, have never, or don't consider themselves makers, or have heard about maker spaces and 3D printers. Let's talk a little bit about what a maker is and what. Um, the maker movement is because that's something that it's one of those buzzwords I think mm -hmm. that we hear about especially in the tech world So talk a little bit about what a maker is from your perspective mm -hmm. um, And then I can maybe talk a little bit about it from my perspective as a tech consultant Eric Gill a 20th century sculptor said that the artist is not a different kind of person but every person is a different kind of artist. Ooh. I think you can take out artist and put in maker and mm. that sums it up. Um, uh, Neil Gershenfeld of MIT said, and I could not agree more, that the power of fabrication is not technical, it's social. Mm. So for a public library, this idea of creating access to disruptive technologies in the center of the community, free and open access, is as natural to us as creating access to a downloadable audiobook or a children's program or any number of things that you think of when you think of a public library. So for us, it wasn't this tremendous shift in uh, worldview. It was more of uh, developing a deeper understanding that there were different opportunities and different desires and aspirations out in our community that we could more closely align with if we put the appropriate things onto our platform to generate more interest and in, uh, library use. So 3D printers, laser cutters, sewing machines, whatever it might be, we understood that these were things that our community was interested in because we talked to them. We talked mm. to them every day. So for us, the challenge was just do what we do better than ever and reach out into the community and find the expertise and the talent and the interest that's already there and bring those people onto the platform to share their knowledge with their neighbors. For instance, you might be a retired physics professor who has a real interest in robotics so we harness that energy and enthusiasm and bring that person onto our platform to be and give them what they need, whether it's space or access to technology or support or promotion or whatever it might be, and bring the community, to, to community together around the expertise and the talent that's already out there. Hmm. So for librarians, the challenge is not, oh, geez, this is one more thing I need to learn to do, or is this what librarians do? No, it's not necessarily what librarians do. You don't need to become a 3D printing expert or a 3D design expert or a sewer. You don't need to do those things. What we need to do as an industry and, and as a profession better than we ever have before is reach out into the community 
and find ways to identify that talent and expertise that's already out there and bring them in so that they can share and create new knowledge with their neighbors without being programmed. Interesting. So, so I guess from my perspective as someone who works with a lot of innovators um, in a variety of different industries, whether it's defense or education or um, small businesses looking to scale and grow using technology, um, Makers are tinkerers at heart. Um, and tinker, I know I have an engineering background and I used to always break things as a kid. Um, if there was a VCR and they wanted me to program the clock, I would take it apart instead. Um, you weren't breaking that. <laughs> you, you were exercising right. that natural curiosity. And, right. and going back to Eric Gill, you know, the idea that, you know, well, who's a maker and what makes a maker a maker? Everybody's a maker. Some makers make to solve a real world problem or to come up with a solution mm. um, to, to improve society. Some mm. people make because it speaks to a passion that they might have. Um, some mm. people come together around making, like Neil, Neil Gershenfeld uh, suggested, because it's social. It's another opportunity to come together and maybe learn a new skill and or just come together with people in your community and think about things of similar interest or think about things that are, you know, maybe a little bit more challenging mm -hmm. or that, that uh, cause you to think in new and different ways. So, you know, we're all makers in, in mm -hmm. some shape or form. So, in thinking about, I guess, the audience here and how essentially they are all makers, um, what are some examples of some makers that you've seen or that you've worked with that have come to the lab? Mm -hmm. uh, because I know when we think of makers, generally speaking, people think of 3D printers, but obviously there's way more to being a maker and being involved in maker spaces um, than just 3D printers. So could you give us some more examples of other types of makers that, um, that people might not be aware of? Yes, and 3D printers do not a maker space make. 3D printers are just a tool, one of the many right. tools of making. Right. It's one of the more high-tech mm. tools, but it's just one of many. Um, some great examples of making that's bringing the community together and uh, also solving some real world problems would include um, sewing. Uh, when we first uh, dove into this idea that we were going to intentionally reach out into our community to get a deeper understanding of the types of making activities that would appeal to our community, we quickly found that sewing was something that was of, of great interest. We uh, actually we have this PR tool, it's called In the Stalls, and we actually put it in the stall doors in the, in the restrooms, uh -huh. so most people eventually see it. And in, in this little In the Stalls notice, we said, we're interested in getting started with sewing. Mm. You know, let us know if you're interested. Mm. Well, that little piece of publicity and kind of looking outward into the community resulted in a battalion of people, women, men, different ages, different demographics of people coming in wanting to be involved with sewing. And some of the best outcomes of that were uh, the, the um, elderly woman who's been sewing alone in her kitchen for 25 years suddenly has found a community of people and uh, has that opportunity to think of the library in a completely different way, wow. but also to uh, improve her life and, and enhance her, her experience. Um, uh, we've had sew-a-thons where the community has come together and sewed uh, sleeping bags that uh, oh, yeah. wrap up into backpacks for the homeless. I think they sewed uh, 200 of them uh, wow. last winter. So um, th those are the kinds of, wow. of exciting, low-tech making activities wow. that are happening. And once again, as a public library, yeah. we're looking at making through this social, uh, connecting, awesome. engagement type of lens. So that's, a, I think, from our perspective, a really powerful example of what making can, can, can accomplish. Wow, so while you're, um, and I, I have a, I don't know, I feel some kind of way when we think of low tech, um, because as someone who's sort of immersed in the middle of the technology world, um, there's this elitist thing that I just don't like so much. Mm -hmm. um, it's different kind of tech. Uh, because at the end of the day, when we go back in time and look back in history, at the end of the day, we want to solve a problem. Um, technology doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be expensive. Right. So um, I just want to make sure that, you know, when we think about technology, it is, there isn't a, a high tech or low tech thing. It's just more complicated or less complicated. Um, I just want to put that out there. But 
Well, there's equipment and then there's yeah. technology when yeah. you think of making. Mm. So maybe high and low tech isn't necessarily the, the white, right, right way to frame it, mm. but a hand crank orange juice maker is a tool of making. It is. Right? Is that high or low tech? Is it a piece of equipment? Is it technology? Yeah. Well, it's, it's mm. a tool of making. Right. right. Right? A sewing machine is not necessarily complex, but uh, 3D design software is. And all of those things kind of live together in the FFL Fab Lab, and the community of users define the value and, and their own experience uh, with, with these tools and with this equipment. True. So uh, we run the spectrum from that um, access and enjoyment of the tools of making that aren't necessarily complex or technical, as well as the considerably complex uh, uh, opportunities as well. Hmm. So how do you tackle someone who comes into the library and wants to engage in these technologies and be a part of the community? If I was, uh, let's just say I'm a child and I'm just curious, how would you, what kind of conversation would you have with the child or the parent? Mm -hmm. Well, we continually, continually have informal, informal conversations with, with our entire community of users. So if a child comes in and sees the 3D printer that's behind our circulation desk that's constantly generating something so that we can uh, you know, capture people's attention and get that conversation started, if a child says, what's that? We tell them, we bring them, we show them. Mm. And uh, you know, uh, really wonderful things happen for families once a member of the family is engaged by something new or interesting or disruptive in the library. For instance, we've gone out to schools and have brought a 3D printer or other tools of making and, uh, a, and say a third grade child will then go home and tell their parents and next thing we know that entire family comes in to get 3D printer certified. Um, in order to use this equipment on their own, um, uh, the, the, for community members to use the equipment on their own, they're required to uh, do a one-on-one -on -one with a member of the staff or one of these community participants, these volunteers who give their time and, their, and share their knowledge with their neighbors. They come in and uh, go through a simple uh, process. Any of the tools or equipment or technology that's pointy, hot, sharp, you know, has some sort of um, uh, safety you know, uh, issues related to it, this certification is required. And once they go through that certification, we put a special designation on their library card. And from that point forward, they have the key to the kingdom. They can come in and use any of the equipment that they're certified on at any time. And the wonderful thing that happens in the Fab Lab is you see um, maybe uh, someone is coming in and using the 3D printer and they haven't had a lot of experience with right. it. Uh, the, the, the people who have had some more experience where they are 3D printing will start helping. And you know, great. great conversations and relationships have developed out of that. Uh, lots of invention and discovery and entrepreneurial spirit is, is evident every day in the Fab Lab. Amazing, amazing connections. That, that's a really good segue um, because there are, a lot, there are a number of entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs, people who are interested in entrepreneurship in the audience. Um, how has the library helped entrepreneurs in particular? You mentioned prototyping, you mentioned software, a lot of the software, especially the engineering software, is quite expensive. So um, how has the library or how do, you, how do you envision the library helping entrepreneurs in this region? Mm -hmm. Well, once again, we're all about the access. So for instance, we're a, a public library, we're a not-for-profit, we are, um, our audience is the general public. So when we create access to tools and equipment and technology, what we're doing is we're looking for that um, uh, curiosity or that uh, beginner to come in and start to get comfortable, to learn the basics, and to understand um, uh, what, what is interesting to them, and then uh, uh, gain a skill set. And then at that point, if someone, for instance, we had someone who came to our Fab Lab regularly for many, many months after it was opened, and he was making uh, parts for trains. And ultimately, he got to the point where it was evident that he needed to find an opportunity to produce. Right. So for us, something like the salt maker space, at that point, we can refer someone like that to a for-profit maker space because we're not about production. We're okay. about the discovery, the learning, the prototyping, the initial design, et cetera. But when someone gets to that point of production, 
Um, mm. We're not equipped for that, and it's right. not necessarily our mission. Our mission is to create the access to, to, to help the interest develop and the skill set develop. But at that point, and that's the beauty, I think, and the synergy between a public library makerspace and a for-profit makerspace, mm. we can do reverse referrals. A for-profit mm. makerspace, for instance, might not be equipped for, for children. Right. True. So True. if someone uh, if a family came to a for profit makerspace and the, the folks there were aware that, oh, the Fayetteville Free Library has all kinds of opportunities for you for, as young as, you know, three years old, yeah. four years old, they can refer them to us. And then at that point where they get um, mm. of a certain age or at a certain skill set and they have different needs, we can refer Make them back. Handle. That's awesome. So I think that's the direction that we are heading in. And um, um, I'm hopeful that those relationships can continue to grow. Uh, we're not in competition. It's a great natural partnership, I think. Great. And so we often use the term ecosystem. And for you know the biologists in the room, or for those who aren't biologists, ecosystem refers to separate parts that operate can operate on their own, but um, have ways in which they help each other become better. And so, you know, the library could very well operate on its own and continue the education that it does. But, you know, for an entrepreneur like someone who I worked with for a little bit of time who wanted to create a motion censored toothbrush for kids, um, he actually worked out of the Fayetteville Free Library for a certain amount of time to prototype his first <coughs> cases. Um, if you try to go to a manufacturing facility, they will charge you a bunch. Um, it's very difficult to prototype because for a manufacturer, I, in order for this to be profitable for me, I need to run 10,000 of them. And if you're not at the point where your design is ready for a run of 10,000, you're wasting your time and money and you're also wasting mine. So um, as part of you know, these community conversations that we continue to have, I think it's important that we expose more opportunities like the work being done by Sue and her team at the Fayette for Free Library. And sooner or later, if you haven't visited the Salt Makerspace, it's actually just across the street. Um, and so when we think about the Fayetteville, the Fab Lab, and the level of the types of tools that are offered there versus those at the Salt Makerspace, you can see that there's a gradual progression and then from the tech artist perspective, we need these, um, these partners because I can already see how this would go. Someone would go to the Fayetteville Free Library, work there for a little bit of time, then go to the Salt Makerspace, and then come to the tech garden because, hey, I need 50 grand <laughs> to scale my company. Okay, So these community partners work together, and um, I'm really happy that uh, you're providing this service because there are so many folks who didn't know. How many of you didn't know that the Fayetteville Free Library offered these services? Okay, so after this event, we will have some information <laughs> outside where you can learn a little bit more about the resources that are offered there, including the workshop. So if you are a professional and you'd like to volunteer your skills, um, I'm sure Sue and her team so would love to, or you're not. I'm just really interested in working with you know other yeah. people in the community, and you know we can help you build a skill set that will allow you to do that confidently. Here you go. We're, we're eager, eager to everyone. talk with you. There's something Absolutely. for everyone. So that's, Tony, I have yeah. two more quick examples yes, if we have yes, time please, of please, uh, please. Um, an interesting and kind of remarkable invention uh, happening yeah. at, at the library. Entrepreneurial discovery, exciting things. We had a middle school boy who uh, used the Fab Lab from the day that it opened, and um, he's one of uh, he's a DIY enthusiast, mm. and so he did a lot of competitions on DIY.org, and uh, he earned badges, physical badges for for these competitions, and he wanted to develop a badge holder for these badges that he was earning, but he couldn't find already produced what he wanted. Right. So true to his DIY nature, he decided he would make something in the Fab Lab. And we had recently acquired a uh, laser cutter at the request of the community, several requests from the community. <laughs> it was kind of one of those what's next things, and they let us know, now that we have this, we need yeah. that. So we had this laser cutter, and once again, we weren't experts. And we were looking for um, someone with expertise to help train not only the community, but also our staff. And uh, this young man, 
uh, taught us more than we could ever have learned in any other way about how this machine worked. And he developed his badge holder, and it became a top trending item on DIY.org for wow. many weeks. And ultimately, it resulted in DIY.org and NPR uh, coming together, and he had an interview on NPR. So, you know, really amazing, amazing results from this kind of community-based curiosity and creativity. Another really excellent example, I think, of uh, real-world problem solving, we have a dad in our community uh, who has a daughter with um, extreme mobility restrictions. And he was interested in using the tools and the equipment and the technology in the fab lab to develop a motion-activated switch for toys that uh, 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 play music. His daughter loves music. So he actually developed um, lots of intensive work in the fab lab, a motion activated switch that the daughter just moves her foot and she can change the music on her toys. And so that's a powerful example of, you know, something, there was a need, he wasn't finding it, he had this access in his public library to go there and say, I, I need this thing, but I can't find one and I'd like to develop it. So that's for us is a great result and a really good example of how just putting the things on the platform and right. inviting the community in. And in, literally innovation at its finest. Yes. That's amazing. Yes. So, so I, 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 I want to bounce some ideas off of that. So you mentioned earlier that makerspaces are a reflection of the community. You reached out and you talked to the community here. You, you um, gathered information and then you purchased and built out a uh, a resource that they wanted. So how do library makerspaces in other cities compare? Are there, um, are there makerspaces that specialize in, I don't know, music or, or makerspaces that specialize in, I don't know, nanoscience, I don't know. Yes, and that's the beauty part of making in public libraries. Every community is different. Mm -hmm. So every public library makerspace is going to be different. There's no room here to develop the toolkit and plunk it into every library across the country. That's not the right solution. The solution is, once again, for librarians to do what we do really well and dig deeper out into the community to understand what the community's needs are, what their aspirations are, what their goals are, and what they need to get their hands on to be able to reach those goals. So in some communities, uh, a makerspace might be a garage where people bring old cars that the community can come in and work on cars. A makerspace might be all about music, where people come and jam and create new music and, and um, have a great time. Uh, it could be, uh, for instance, in, in our community, sewing was a really big deal. But maybe the community down the street, if the uh, library folks there say, okay, up in Fayetteville, they're sewing like mad. So let's buy 15 sewing machines and see what happens. Those sewing machines more than likely are going to sit in the closet because the potential is, is that sewing isn't important in that community. So it's, uh, it's tricky uh, uh, the, uh, for public libraries to go down this road without having a really deep and comprehensive knowledge and understanding of what's important in their community. And the only way to know that is to talk to them. We have to kind of bust out of all those assumptions that we have that we know best and we know what they want. We don't. We don't. We have to give formal and informal opportunities to be able to hear from them. Um, I brought with me today a form that we use. It's in all of our service areas and we bring it with us everywhere that we go. And it's like a volunteer application, but it's really not. We ask three simple questions. What do you love to do? What are you passionate about? And most importantly, are you willing to share it with your neighbors? And from this form, I could be a circulation clerk at the front desk having a casual conversation with someone who mentions that they're interested in, you know, really passionate about um, skiing or dog grooming or robotics. And then what we do is we take this form and we capture that. Hey, would you be, you know, do, do, would you be willing to share this knowledge with your neighbors? And more often than not, people at first they're shocked because you're asking them, you know, to share something that they love and something that they're passionate about. And how often does that happen? You know, it doesn't. It doesn't usually happen. Um, so uh, people at first are like, well, I can do that? Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you have you, permission. You, you, you can do that. 
And what we can do for you is give you the things that you need to be able to be successful in sharing your knowledge with your neighbors and also in creating new knowledge. So that form is out there and I encourage everybody to take a look at it. For us, it's been a great community engagement uh, tool and a great catalyst to getting tons of people into the library uh, to share what they love. <laughs>